Good evening. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to this meeting of the Foundation for Science and Technology. Welcome to our audience here physically in the Royal Society. And in the spirit of bold innovation, we've got a different seating plan. What more could we do than that to show how we're always going to try out new things? Uh, and a warm welcome as well to our online participants for our meeting on the role of the UK National Laboratories. Um, we have, of course, we are holding this event during the period of HERDA, and for that reason we are being very restrained. There is no governmental view, there are no representatives speaking on government policy. I think there may be some civil servants here in the room whose lips are sealed, but I'm sure their ears are open for the interesting points we're going to hear from our participants. We are very grateful to our sponsors this evening, Advanced Research Clusters, Air2, the National Physical Laboratory and the National Measurement Laboratory at LGC. We're grateful to them all for supporting this event. And of course, uh, national labs are a very important topic. I was reminded, well, Patrick, Sir Patrick Valance, our first speaker, of course, was made an important contribution to the debate with his report back in 2019, a review of government science capability that really put PSREs to the fore. And since then, we've had also national labs covered by Paul Nurse in his report. So I'm delighted that we will hear first from Sir Patrick Valance. We will then be joined uh, online by uh, Professor Steve Cowley, who is now the director of Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. We'll then hear from Dr. Karen Hang Hoy, who is director of the British Geological Survey, and finally from Dr. Julian Braybrook, director of, of the LGC National Labs and UK government chemist. But first, it is fantastic that Sir Patrick, with his extraordinary experience, not least as government chief science advisor, as well as having reviewed the science landscape, is speaking to us this evening. Patrick, a warm welcome. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much indeed, um, David, and nice to be here this evening. So, um, first thing to say is, uh, um, I don't think anyone can really define what a public sector research establishment is. So there's no accurate definition, and whether they are the same as national laboratories, I don't know. But let me, in the absence of a definition, just give some examples. So the National Physical Laboratory is based in Teddington. It has uh, um, a site in the northeast, it has a site, another site in the south, and it has a site in Scotland. And it was set up to look at the science of metrology. It was set up in 1900. It has done a lot of important work in the early days of computing. It was the place that made the first atomic clock in 1955 on cesium. It's worked on packet switching, quantum. And when I was at GlaxoSmithKline, we had a collaboration with the NPL uh, on imaging mass spectrometry, which is a very difficult technology to quantify. And that was crucial for us in the industry to try and get some imaging of where drugs were going into cells. Another example, uh, which is in York, Ferrer, which is on this, on this uh, list here, which is the Food and Environment Research Agency, or was, it used to be a DEFRA uh, PSRE, uh, and it was transferred to become a public-private joint venture in 2015, uh, used to house the uh, Plant Health Inspectorate and the National B Unit, and yes, I didn't know there was a National B Unit either, um, which are now at the animal, plant, and health um, uh, um, uh, laboratories. And FERA remains, despite the fact it's now actually an independent private organization, remains a nat na national reference laboratory. And it's part of the National Laboratory Alliance, something I'll come back to in just a minute. During the Novichok poisonings, if you will remember that, after the poisonings themselves, there was a question about cleanup of the environment, and it turned out the ability to access mass spectrometry 
to understand what the measure able well, to make the measurements in the environment was pretty difficult and ferra became a really important resource during that national emergency let's take another one the met office down in exeter and, and of course the met office uh, deals with weather but actually during uh, mrs thatcher's uh, government uh, the Hadley Centre was set up, which moved the Met Office into also having a world-class climate science uh, activity, which has been hugely influential in climate science in the UK and globally. So they deal with weather, they deal with climate, they've got the joint unit with the Environment Agency on flooding. They have, of course, got a supercomputer, and one of the things the UK doesn't have is a very strong and effective com com a large compute infrastructure. So this supercomputer and the next one that they're going to get is an important part of that. They also deal with space weather and are an important source of information on potential impact of space weather and are working with the Alan Turing Institute looking at what AI might do to improve some of the ability to get greater granularity on weather forecasting, the sort of thing that's going to be really important as we think about adaptation to climate change. A, third, a fourth example, um, CFAS, so the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture, uh, Aquaculture Surveillance, which uh, on this, this one is down in Weymouth, but it's actually got more sites as well. This does surveillance of fish stocks, surveillance of marine quality around the coast of the UK. It does research, it does policy work, and is an important part of the um, uh, DEFRA stable again. And the institute where I'm now chair, uh, uh, chair of the trustees, the Natural History Museum, has 350 scientists. And those 350 scientists work on a range of areas, including things directly relevant to government policy, such as climate research and biodiversity research. And using access to collections going back a very long period and around the world have put together a biodiversity intactness index which allows you to look around the world and say how much of the biodiversity that was present pre-industrial revolution pre the appearance actually of mankind is still present today in the uk we're about 50 percent of the biodiversity less this this biodiversity intactness index is now on Bloomberg terminals, so investors can start to look at it and say, what are companies doing? So unexpected links through to company and finance. And we're gonna hear from Karen, the British Geological um, Survey has been unbelievably important during times of emergencies, particularly one thinks of, of, of volcanic situations where they become crucial to government decision-making. So when I look around, you can see here, there are something like 50 public sector research establishments, they're all over the UK. They report not into a single department in government, but into eight different departments. Um, maybe I'll have a quiz and say which one reports into the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, there's very diverse expertise and there's 17,000 um, science and technology staff. So my points that I want to make in this slide are the public sector research establishments are less well known than they should be. I didn't know about them, particularly before I joined government. I did a little bit. Paul Nurse's report illustrates how many people don't know about them. I think Paul himself wasn't particularly familiar with them before he started that. So these are hidden. And it's not just other scientists who don't know. I would wager that many ministers in those eight departments haven't got a clue what PSREs sit under those departments. Some of them would not even know they had a PSRE. They are geographically dispersed. They do research, they do monitoring, they do policy, and they have links to business. They have vastly different funding models. So they're complete, some of them are completely different. Some are private public partnerships, some are privately run, but actually on behalf of the state, some of them are totally public. Uh, they have different host departments, as I've said. They have different terms and conditions for the staff that work there, so actually it's quite difficult for people to move between them. And of course, as I've alluded to with the Met Office, but it's true for many others, they create an infrastructure which is important for science more broadly, and a capacity. 
So these are important. And David has already uh, alluded to the fact that in 2019, uh, together with Treasury, uh, Government Office of Science wrote a report, the Science Capability Review, asking the question, what was the capability of science across government and what needed to happen? And one of the areas that we touched on was PSREs. And we said, there's lots of good ones and there's lots of good things going on, but it's all a bit ad hoc and it's uncoordinated. And in fact, we also touched on an important area, which is how they might be involved in business and linking through into the economy. And we said there are a number of things that should happen because these are important parts of the um, R&D infrastructure. Departments need to ensure they have adequate long-term funding. Research funders need to open up funding schemes for the PSREs because a rather bizarre situation existed where certain PSREs could apply for a UKRI grant and others couldn't. And the ones that couldn't were largely not in the department where UKRI sat. Now that doesn't make any sense from a sort of government perspective. It may make sort of departmental sense, but it doesn't make government sense. Um, we said that there ought to be a fund for innovation and that as part of what was then the aim to get to 2.4 percent of uh, GDP R&D that this should be part of looking part of that should be looking at what the public uh, laboratories could do to be um, uh, help with local business and, and, and growth agenda. Now how's, how, what's happened since then? Well there was an update uh, um, this year which obviously I, I'd left by then but the, the, the update uh, of the Science Capability Review had one of the four things that it looked at was the um, public laboratories and it still said ensure sufficient capacity capability uh, uh, and quality within the pu public laboratories and the government response to the review says the wide range of PSREs present a significant resource for government and will have a higher priority in government thinking. Good. What does that mean in practice? What's actually going to happen? It's quite important to pin that down. And there remains, I think, and it was clear in the, in the review, a number of challenges. And maybe, you know, maybe the bottom bits, the, the thing to, 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 to focus on, progress has been made towards better utilization of government-owned pub public laboratories and expanding eligibility for funding streams. They are now able to apply for UKRI funding, but there are still challenges. The funding actually is, often in a way that's very difficult for public labs to take because it's not full economic cost for them. And in many cases, the um, science missions of the public laboratories need to be better defined. So I'm going to end by talking about what I think are some key features of what would make a difference. And this relates to the current system, but I'll come on to what a future system might look like. The first is that every department should have a senior, accountable individual who actually cares about the PSREs in those departments. Now, every department does have somebody, but it's often part of somebody's job, and it's not necessarily a very senior person who's got that accountability. So the PSREs need somebody in the department who really cares about it, and a minister who really cares about the PSREs as part of their job. The department needs to define what they actually have got these PSREs for. What is it they want them to do? What is it that is important for the department that these PSREs can deliver? They need to have a system for quality assessment. How do they know that what's going on in the PSREs is high quality science and relevant to the mission? And I think that's somewhere where the chief scientific advisors can play, really play a role. And they need to worry about career structures. Because if individuals in a PSRE can only think of their career development in terms of the PSRE they currently happen to be in, that's a mistake. And I mentioned earlier the National Laboratory Alliance. This was set up on the back of the 2019 uh, review. Uh, 11 PSREs got together and said, we can work better together. We can do things of common interest. We can share equipment and we can look at staff uh, promotion and development activities across, and that's still still going. Um, those things, I think, would make a difference. But there's another point which I'll end on, which is there's now a Department of Science, Innovation and Technology. And one of the problems with the PSRE landscape across government is 
you could have every department looking after its own bit, as I said, and I think that does need to happen. But you need somewhere where you can look across the totality and ask, is it what we need? And what is the, what Paul Nurse in his recent report described as a national plan for R&D infrastructure? Where do these fit in? And I think I would argue that DSET, the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, could take that on as a cross-government accountability not to own all the PSREs, I think they're rightly owned in the departments that they serve, but to ensure that we have the appropriate quality and we look across for opportunities. I will finish there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick, for really bringing us up to date on the policy debate on PSREs and I'm sure people will want to follow up in those uh, points when we get to the panel discussion and I should say to our participants online do of course use the Q&A function on Zoom please not the chat function the Q&A function and put in your questions and upvote the questions that you are particularly interested in. Uh, so our next speaker is Professor Steve Cowley who's got a fantastic experience of the British model and the American model and may be able to reflect on some of the differences between them. He's now based at Princeton at the Plasma Physics Lab. He, of course, was previously Chief Executive of the UK Atomic Energy Authority and he's now Chair-Elect of the Faraday Institution. Uh, Steve is an old friend. It's great to see you joining us from the US Steve, uh, and now over to you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep. It's all good. online. Yep. Good, good, excellent. And you just worry about this technology, uh, even though we've been using it a lot. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm in in, in St. Louis, actually, St. Louis. Um, uh, my experience with national labs are is kind of narrow in a sense that my experience is very much in terms of the uh, sort of the model that the US came up with uh, after the Second World War, which we in Britain uh, essentially followed. There have been national labs pretty much as you know in the modern world I mean, since Napoleon probably um, of one sort or another. Um, but the one that sort of stands out now in the in the public imagination, um, is initiated, I think, by the Manhattan Project, and we've probably all seen Oppenheimer and and, and how that is. On the the picture on the right hand side at the bottom there is area the area two at uh, Los Alamos. Um, uh, Los Alamos is a lab of sixteen thousand employees. Uh, it's a massive operation, um, and it maintains a level of excellence that's absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, it is part of the DOE system of national labs. There are 17 national labs in the DOE system. Uh, my lab, the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, is one of the smaller ones at about 850 employees, um, but a legendary lab of, in its own right in the, in the field of, of plasma physics and fusion research. On the left-hand side at the bottom is Harwell, circa 1972. Um, and our response... Uh, in the UK to the Manhattan Project and the tremendous effort we put in to become a nuclear power, um, both uh, for military and for civilian reasons. Um, I've often felt that we've never quite uh, celebrated enough uh, the immense achievement of the 40s, 50s and 60s in uh, putting ourselves on the map as, an, as a nuclear power. And it was done through national labs. Um, you could not have done this um, without the sort of combined resources national labs. And that's kind of be, going to be my theme tonight. Um, I'm not an expert in institutes or um, the, the other kinds of uh, PSREs that, that Patrick was talking about. I, this is where my experience comes from. Uh, that experience includes uh, the one on the left, what I call my beloved column, uh, a, an, an amazing lab where... Uh, incredible things were done and hosted one of the world's premier large facilities jet for 40 years um, and ran it incredibly well uh, during that time. 
and it's an incredible resource for the country. On the right-hand side is the lab that I currently run, which is the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. 91 acres, um, 290 um, engineers, 130 PhDs. Um, uh, started in 1951 uh, to do fusion research. And now we have a, a portfolio of research that includes fusion, but also supporting the microelectronics industry. Um, the next generation of tools that are going to build the chips of tomorrow. Um, as we get down to sort of four, three, two nanometers in the feature scale on, on a chip, we have to know how to manufacture that. And chips are manufactured in plasmas. And so since we're the plasma physics lab, it was an obvious extension of our mission uh, into that space. So well coordinated with industry, well coordinated with academia. We're run by Princeton University for the government through what's called an M&O contract. And this is an interesting way to run one of these in institutions because it links to a very strong academic institution. But on the other hand, our, our primary uh, funder is the government and the government sets the agenda in many ways. Um, thinking about the portfolio of things you have to have to be a science superpower. Um, I remember visiting when I was on the CST, visiting France and uh, at, with the French Academy and talking to them. And you can sense this going around Europe, the envy, I think, of our research universities. If you look at the you know rankings of universities around the world, British universities and American universities stand out. And that model of the sort of individual PI investigator at research unit uh, of universities with their postdocs, their graduate students, and, and the sort of almost entrepreneurial nature of that research exercise is just uh, spectacular. I mean, it's it, it's why we are so um, uh, successful, I think, in research in the UK and, and in the, and the US. The sort of recent tweak of that has been the model um, which I think a lot of American universities are now trying to to find their 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 bearing in, which is the model I think we see in the UK. Um, I mentioned Cambridge, but I think several other UK universities are doing this well, where the university is really well connected to tech industry around it, um, and the tech industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the biomedical industry, you know. Um, computer industry the, the, these are a new model of university research that is also i think incredibly successful national labs can't compete with this if 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 i steered my lab towards uh, that kind of competition um it's a very efficient model the university model and it's not something you can do but it's not what we're made to do right uh, in, in the national lab system um there are problems in science that require scale and this is, of course, you go back to the Manhattan uh, uh, Project. Uh, at the time when they built the Manhattan Project, the Manhattan Project was the scale of the, uh, of the automobile industry in the United States at the time, 130,000 employees. Uh, you, need, uh, you need teamwork. You need this incredible mixture of skills. You need engineers to build your facilities and your labs and your uh, various parts of what you're doing. You need scientists. In, in the case of the Manhattan Project and the early, you know, Harwell and, and AWE and, and the British, early British nuclear labs, um, it was chemists and physicists and engineers and metallurgists, uh, enormous amount of teamwork. And then you need organization. You need to be able to project manage that. You need to be able to set that forward. Um, there are certain science problems and there are still many that exist um, that you can't do in a garage in Palo Alto. You can't do on a bench in the Blackett Lab in, at Imperial College, um, the place I, I loved working. Um, they're at a scale that you need a national lab, and, and you need a national lab uh, to deliver that kind of science and technology. It's a very successful model. Like the, the one I always quote, um, uh, we, we get together national lab directors in the DOE system. There are 17 of us, and, and we have sort of group therapy sessions about, you know, running national labs and dealing with government and things like that. Um, and uh, Mike Witherall, who's the, the director of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, 
Um, this is a, a shining example of, of a very successful national lab. 16 Nobel laureates as, associated with our Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Of course, it's just up the hill from, from Berkeley, so it has a strong connection to, to uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, and many of the national labs in the United States system do. You know, Slack is at Stanford. That's the Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab that now does all kinds of things apart from high energy physics. Fermilab, which University of Chicago, and my lab, which is run by Princeton University. Um, when, when you look around the world, it's not just the American labs that are, are, are real shining examples. I mean, we have a small but really uh, impressive set of national labs in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, I'll make my plug here. I, I'm always a little bit too provocative, probably, but they always need nurturing. And, and Patrick's remarks, about that nurturing is not just money, but it is organization and a place to report to in government and all those kind of things. Um, but there are very strong uh, labs in, in Europe. Um, CERN is the classic example. Every uh, national lab director is envious of the, of the stability of the funding and, and the, the commitment to, to CERN. Um, but going back, research universities and, uh, and national labs, you need both if you're gonna be a science superpower. You can't, you, you can't just neglect one part of the, of the science. This kind of science at scale is, is a critically important. Um, <clears throat> National labs almost always, it's a bit like, you know, owning a shopping mall uh, anchored in, in large facilities. Um, you need that large facility as the sort of reason, raison d'etre for the lab, often um, large hadron collider at um, CERN, jet at Cullum for many years, uh, diamond and ISIS up at SDFC. They play, uh, and these play a central role in science, these large facilities. I mean, they, they are really at the cutting edge. Those facilities used to be nationally owned. In fact, you go even further back, sometimes universities owned them, but nationally owned at some point. But these days, facilities are increasingly um, um, shared between countries, um, in regions, some of them completely international. Um, and, and they have become global. And playing in that world, you have to have strong national labs. Um, and you need teams of engineers to run the facility, to design the facility, conceive it, design, build uh, such facilities. Um, it's an amazing thing, building facilities. I've built two now um, in my time. And uh, it's uh, working with the teams and, you know, saying we have this science goal, but we need to build a, a whole set of facilities around this. This is goes right back to the Second World War and what they were doing at Los Alamos. They were building cyclotrons to measure cross sections. They were doing separation plants. It's it, it, it's part of the way we operate. Um, all those facilities are at the cutting edge of technology. They're the things that really challenge engineering at, at the extreme, maybe superconducting magnets, electronics, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of the uh, pushing technology forward has been done to build the next set of science facilities. Um, I, I want to make a point about that, which is one-off engineering is very challenging these days, building one thing, right? um, and working with industry to build that one thing it can be extremely hard work, and I, I've done quite a bit of it in, in my career, um, but it's extraordinarily good bo for both partners, not just the National Lab, but also the industry partners who are learning to do things in conjunction with the National Lab that upskills their capability. One of the things that happened with ITER, for instance, was that uh, the, the makers of superconducting strand um, uh, got a big boost because they had to make these new big magnets that uh, went on ITER. Um, Industry partners on STEP, which is the UK's uh, fusion pilot plant design effort um, that uh, Ian Chapman and Crow, crew at Culloma uh, are leading, uh, are learning a tremendous amount in, in the whole process of building a facility. It's a different way of working with industry than sort of um, the, the model of working with startups, et cetera. It's usually the big primes that you're working with, but it's extremely good in, in, in stimulating industry and uh, the way you go. Last two points. 
and then I'll get off. Um, I, I think national labs are a strategic asset. In times of trouble, you, you turn to them. Um, in times when you need new weapon systems, or as Patrick was saying, you know, you have a, a national emergency, you turn because you've got this uh, set of expertise that has been nurtured, has been grown, has been uh, has been uh, part of the system for many years. Um, the workforce, and I saw this very much at Cullum, uh, we had a um, uh, workforce flowed between us and SDFC and Oxford Instruments and uh, Atkins um, and various other parts of the high-tech engineering industry. Um, it's part of the portfolio. It's the part of the way you stay a very strong engineering and uh, science uh, nation. Uh, my last point, which is a bit gratuitous, so sorry about this, but uh, what is the UK's next great science facility? Are we, uh, is it, is it going to be a global uh, competitor? Who are going to be our partners? Who would share the cost? Um, these are good questions. I don't think we should be out of the business of having uh, globally competitive, large-scale science facilities. And it needs long, long-term planning, and it needs to nurture you know, capabilities and organizations like SDFC and, and UK AEA. There are probably conversations in the UK about this that I'm just not privy to, but uh, it is a concern of mine. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And I hope we'll be able to stay online for the Q&A. And certainly that question, what should be our next big national lab? I think it's a great one that I hope we will be able to discuss as the panel. And thank you also for raising that important question of the, the balance between university facilities and national labs. Um, we're now going to turn to our third speaker, who also brings valuable international experience. Dr. Karen Hanghoy was, is now the director of the British Geological Survey, uh, but she did her PhD in geology from Copenhagen University. It's wonderful that she is over here running a UK national facility, and we very much look forward to what you're going to say, Karen. Thank you very much. It's really lovely to be here. And we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive now, and, and, and you'll get to know everything you ever wanted to know about the British Geological Survey. And I think there's been a couple of key words said already. Capability, incredibly important. And I'm going to use that word a lot as well. And I hope we can discuss that word, what does it actually mean? And Steve talked a lot about scale. And I think Steve sort of particularly meant scale of infrastructure. But I'm going to talk about scale as well, but it's more sort of national scale and decadal scale. So the scale on which we work. And I'm going to try to press an arrow. There it is. So I'm going to tell you about what is the British Geological Survey. And, and, and people struggle, actually, if they don't know the British Geological Survey, and many of you probably do not, they struggle even with the name. What is that? What is a survey as an organization? And people's eyes will glaze over and they will start, when they read it back to you, uh, shortly after they will be talking about the geographical society or something like that, because they don't actually necessarily recognize even the words and what they mean and what they mean in the context of a research center. And the, we get a little bit of help from the Ordnance Survey. People have heard about the Ordnance Survey and they map. And the British Geological Survey does that as well. We do conduct geological surveys, but for some obscure reason, this name has been uh, uh, sort of what we do has become the name of who we are. So the British Geological Survey is a world leading geological survey organization. So that's a little bit easier for people to comprehend. And it's focused on public good science and national capability. And so there is the capability word. It's about having a national capability in the field of geology, in the field of earth sciences, and understanding the planet. The BGS is a provider of objective and authoritative advice, uh, geoscientific data and information and knowledge for society. And so again, it's the sort of scale of being able to deliver all of those things for the country. 
And we're the oldest geological survey. We actually invented, the UK invented the concept of a geological survey organization. And the BGS was founded, a slightly different name, but about 1830, in, in 1835, and basically found it to do pretty much exactly the same thing we, will be, we do today, which I'll show on the next couple of slides, which is to provide that kind of national capability, understanding how we utilize earth science, how we utilize the earth and our understanding of the earth for society. We are sitting as part of UKRI and actually as part of the Natural Environment Research Council, so NERC, as one of six centers, two of which are fully owned by NERC, and the others have sort of various degrees of independence from NERC today. But so we are sort of mapping into the, um, into DCIT, if you will, if we're sort of following Patrick's, where do people actually map in? But we map in in a very convoluted way. And we're not going to talk about the details of this diagram, but it's just to show how complex a landscape it is to be navigating when you are a national lab and when you do feel that you need to provide this nation with everything it needs to know. Where do you even go with that? And this is sort of where we go. You can see the BGS logo sitting out there, and NERC is right above, and then there's UKRI, and then we're going into UK government sitting in DCIT. And next to the BGS logo, you'll see in sort of a red uh, rectangle, you'll see things that are sitting in central government that are PSREs that are sitting directly in government departments. And then as you move right, you will move into the devolved nations and the various uh, uh, agencies and units that we are reaching out to in those devolved uh, uh, nations. And so it's a, an incredibly complex landscape from sort of a policy point of view. And this is perhaps one of the challenges when you are that kind of flavor of PSRE that, that BGS is, where it's really very much about providing the right kind of advice to the right kind of people if everyone on this map doesn't necessarily know that you exist and even know exactly what you do. So I think another word I'd like to introduce into this, to this uh, discussion today is sort of championing. Who's championing? How to get recognition? And not, not recognition in the kind of like, oh yeah, great job everyone, here's some more money, but actually how can we get the most out of what you know? Because it is actually a lot. So the vision of BGS, to be a leading and trusted provider of geological data and knowledge to meet societal need for a sustainable future. I think we can probably all get behind that. And if we drill that out a little bit more, what does that mean? So basically, use our knowledge of geology, of the earth, of earth science, to address societal challenges. And to do that, we generate data, information, and expertise through observation, analysis, and characterization of earth and geological processes. Lots of people do this in earth science departments. So this is not what actually sets BGS apart, but this is an important thing that everything is sort of founded on. The important things that distinguish us as a geological survey are the next two points, and this has to do with the scale again. To work at local, regional, national, and global scales, and to monitor on multiple time scales, ranging from real time to decadal, but also, of course, into geological time. So if you need to know all of the resources in the UK, for example, it's a national scale problem. You need a national scale kind of project and a national scale organization to do it. So the scale of the way we work is what's setting uh, us apart from some of our colleagues in, in university departments. And then the bottom one is also really important, to be independent and impartial, to actually be able to provide what we know to people who will make important decisions for all of us in a way where you can trust what you're being told. And that basically means sort of translated, of course, that if the UK government and Shell and Greenpeace come and ask us the same question, they will be getting the same answer. And it's gonna be based on what we know about the earth and geology. And it's actually, it's, earth science is incredibly important right now. And it's probably perhaps never been more important. It's always been important. And that's of course why we've had a geological survey for almost 200 years. But right now, all of the challenges that we're facing as a society in terms of decarbonization, mitigation of climate change, hazards around us, environmental uh, 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 mitigations, all of that actually starts with understanding the subsurface. And that's what this sort of diagram kind of illustrates a little bit here is that I like to say everything starts with a rock. 
but it's actually, it's, it's kind of true. It's maybe a little naive, but it is actually true because if you want to think about improved water security, which is one of our big priorities, if you want to think about decarbonization, net zero, if you want to think about living with geological hazards, what's going to happen with coastal erosion in the next 20 years, all those kinds of issues actually start with understanding the subsurface. And it actually, the, the fourth sort of gray priority area for us right now is maps and models for the 21st century. And it's actually translating that knowledge that we have. And, it's, and much of that knowledge is building on these 200 years of legacy knowledge, translating that into a product that you can actually use to go and solve the problem that you need to solve in society. And I'm just, I have a few very quick examples on this. More secure energy transition, for example. So examples here of what we are doing is updating the CO2 storage database for the UK. Again, national scale. What can we do in the North Sea? That is the kind of data that we can actually provide you with. Looking at mineral supply chains and criticality, it's a really, really big topic right now that we're working on uh, quite closely with lots of different partners across the UK and also in government. We are working on geothermal uh, research that can inform policy, inform regula regulation of how we might think about this, but much, much more. These are just examples of what can perhaps be done with geological knowledge. Another one is the improved water security. We have uh, on the left there, we have a, a, a map of developing methods for valuing uh, groundwater, and it's basically mapping what's deployable, what can we actually use in the UK. It's a 2019 study. In the middle there, you have something around uh, chemistry, emergent contaminants, how do we monitor uh, what's going into our drinking water, how do we work with agriculture, and the sort of interface between agriculture and geology, the soil science, how do we look at how groundwater and groundwater uh, flooding is entering into these things. And on the right-hand side is a, is a model for what the groundwater in the UK may do in periods of drought, which is something we will probably be seeing a lot more of. So that's sort of into the climate mitigation understanding as well. Living with geological hazards, very, very important. We help update the geological map. Every time you have, I should have brought my phone up here, every time you actually look at your, at your Google map to find your way to the Royal Society, it's going to have data from the BGS uh, in there because we actually help the Ordnance Survey and, and also work with the, with closely with the Met Office about these national data sets and national scale data sets. Uh, we're working on developing a hazards platform where you can get sort of a one-stop shop for understanding the hazards. It can be landslides, it can be flooding, it can be coastal erosion, and of course it can be things like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and, and things that are happening in our societies. And one example on here is, is, is working from our global work. We do quite a lot of global work as well, and this is an, an example from Indonesia where we're looking at the risk in a fault system in a very large city where about three million people are actually in risk of being uh, severely affected if there's going to be a big earthquake and we know there will be a big earthquake and probably in the next decade or so so we can help with risk assessment and with risk mitigation and we do that quite a lot around the globe in this area and then just briefly on the maps and models because people are like well maps we've had maps of the uk for a really really long time why do we need new maps well we need we need new maps because we have new data, that's one thing. So the maps that we have are actually pretty good, the observations that go into them. And when I talk about maps here, it's geological maps. It's not just, you know, what's the topography, but it's like what's underneath. What do we know about what's underneath in the subsurface? And that's based on a lot of smart people doing a lot of work over the last approximately 200 years. But today we have water wells, we have geophysical investigations, and we actually think about geology in a quite different way. We have plate tectonics today, for example, which we didn't actually have uh, just 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So, so there's a lot of things that have changed. And this is actually how the data and the knowledge that BGS is responsible for is being used by people. So you need to go in and build infrastructure in a place or you are looking at extracting resources or finding groundwater. The first thing that people come and ask us for is a geological map because that tells them where they may go and look for whatever resource or put whichever infrastructure they want to put. So this is a tremendously cost-saving for society. 
because so many mistakes can be made if you don't actually know what you're doing. And a big area that's happening now, you can see sort of in the, in the circle up there, is urban geology. We're using to think about the urban environment as the skyline, but think about all the stuff that's happening underground. All of the uh, waste disposal, all of the transportation, the groundwater, the, all of the stuff that's happening in the underground is affecting the cities. And that's why we see, for example, today, you see very large cities in Asia for example, subsiding because they have been pumping up their groundwater for the last many decades, and that's now causing subsidence in these cities. And again, they didn't have a geological map and a geological model before they started doing that, or they wouldn't have made those mistakes. So maps have many different scales. Again, sometimes it's national scale, sometimes it's very, very local scale. Uh, this is the one in the middle is about ground movement, and the one to the right, again, is the, C, uh, the CO2 storage database. What's the capacity for storing CO2 in the North Sea as we know it today? So many different products, many different services need to come out. And if I can just sort of look ahead, I'm almost, almost through the whirlwind tour of BGS here, but I can just sort of look ahead, uh, what's the next big um, uh, facility in the UK, I think, was Steve's question. But what we are thinking about BDS, what's the next new problem that we need to help solve? We absolutely will not be solving anything alone, but where is it that we need to be present? What is it that we need as a society that we can't do without the British Geological Survey? And a couple of examples on here. The top one is, again, mapping upgrades of our onshore maps, but also our marine maps and our coastal maps. A lot of the solutions, again, to the challenges that we're facing right now are going to sit in the offshore. Energy security, decarbonization, a lot of that's going to happen in the offshore environment. Resource management, about 20 or 30 percent of the gravel and sand that we're using for building roads and houses in the UK is being pumped out from the marine environment. Not many people know that but it's true, and that resource management is going to become increasingly important because there's going to be competitive uses of that space. We have, of course, habitat mapping, which is going to be very important for both the resource management but also for, for living resources. Spatial planning of the subsurface, both onshore and offshore, uh, is going to be very important infrastructure, marine infrastructure. We also the pictures of the, uh, of the gas pipeline in the Baltic Sea <laughs> that got blasted a couple of years ago. So there's also a national security point in here. How do, we, how do we create security for our infrastructure in the offshore and in the onshore environment? And how can we be sure that we will uh, be able to address these challenges? So this, again, the obvious partners here, UKHO, CFAS, many, many, many partners, academic partners, would need to be part of such a program again. But it would take us, if we were going to map, for example, the offshore, for the UK, it would probably take two or three decades. And that's exactly the kind of work that you need a geological survey to do, and that scale of work. The second one is perhaps, the, aside from climate change, the biggest environmental challenge that this country is facing right now is what are we going to do with that radioactive waste that we have? And we can praise ourselves for, the, for, for some of the work that's happened in the last century in terms of uh, both nuclear weapons but also nuclear power. But we have a problem and we need to solve it. And every time we get close to solving it, we shy away from it because it's very controversial and it's very difficult. But this is real environmental challenge and it's really, really big. And a lot of people need to help solve that as well, including the BGS, because you're gonna put it in the ground, you're gonna to need to understand how that rock is gonna behave. What does it look like? How do we characterize it? So you actually need a map. And again, using map in the, in the widest possible sense, 3D, 4D, you name it, but everything, characterizing the rock volume that we're talking about, we need to actually be looking at. We're running experiment at BGS right now that have been running for more than 15 years on properties of rocks that we're thinking about putting radioactive waste in. We can do experiments that run for two or three decades at BGS because we operate on that kind of time scale. Very, very quickly, just a couple of metrics. We are fairly small for some of these PRCs. We have 641 staff currently, but the one I really want to sort of highlight here is the publication. So there's a, so NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council, has a database for downloading all of the papers that come out in that space. And in that downloadable database, there were 369,600 downloads of BGS publications last year. That's more than a thousand downloads per day. 
And these are not nature papers, and they will not be getting anyone any Nobel Prizes either. But there are some good research papers in there because that, underpin that gives us credibility and it underpins the expertise that we have. But a lot of this is a characterization of the Mercia Mottstone because that has great potential for geothermal, for CCS, possibly for stores of radioactive waste, for example. So it's, it's people who are thinking about problems and how they can solve them, people building infrastructure, people thinking ahead for solutions for society. They're downloading our publications a thousand times per day. A budget is about 56 million, and we're getting about half of that uh, straight up from NERC, sort of our base uh, science budget, if you will, to deliver some of that long-term monitoring. And the other half we're getting from what we a mixture of sources, I would say about 70% of that other income is still public funding. A lot of it comes from NERC and other research grants through research grants, but a lot of it comes directly from government. And we work with many government departments, and it's sort of back to, to Patrick's question, who's, who's the champion here? Who's the owner? Who actually knows what we're doing? We work really closely with DESNES, we work really closely with DEFRA, we work really closely with DBT, very close with FCDO, a little bit with some of the others, Ministry of Defense and a few others around. So, so actually, one of our big challenges is how do we navigate that space? How do we make sure that these government departments come to us when they need us? And how do we make sure that we can deliver it? And I am almost done, Gavin. I see your sign. This is my last slide. It's just to show you that we are truly uh, UK. We have uh, several offices, including in Cardiff, Belfast, and in Edinburgh. So we have offices all over the UK. And that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for communicating your enthusiasm about geology. That was fantastic. Uh, now, our final speaker is Dr. Julian Braybrook. He is the government chemist. He has tied that role since 2018, currently Director of Measurement Science for the National Le Measurement Laboratory at LGC. So, Julian, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see, uh, down, excellent. So how can an incoming government make best use of national labs? Um, I'll come back to that with the last slide, but uh, let me just start by saying, um, there are over 620 billion pounds worth of goods and services traded annually uh, in the UK, which rely on some measured quantity or specification, and that's probably an underestimate. Um, but without the confidence um, behind those purchased goods or services, then, um, and the ability that they, they, they have to meet the specification or to conform to uh, regulatory um, or statutory requirements, then UK businesses are undermined. So this is where the UK national measurement system really comes into play. Um, as it says there, it's an essential part of the UK RDI infrastructure. Um, and effectively, what it does is develop and maintain internationally recognized measurement capability standards and practices with the benefits that are indicated um, in the bullets and that I'll uh, come back to shortly. There are a number of laboratories um, uh, that, that are part of the national measurement system, and they're listed at, at the bottom of this slide. Now, to focus a little bit more just on the National Measurement Laboratory at LGC, um, uh, when we talk about missions and roles, it, it, it's, it's reasonably clear. Um, we're, as a metrology lab, we're, uh, and when I talk about metrology, it's about the science of measurement. Um, then we're designated for um, particular areas, uh, chemical and biological measurement, with some exclusions. Um, other laboratories cover some of that space as well. We're internationally leading in, in measurement science and I'll, I'll say why in a second. We have some, what we would term, sovereign uh, measurement traceability in newer areas, um, like nucleic acid quantitation, um, ability to look at nanoparticles and to quantitate those and give concentration amounts, um, and in and around chemical purity. We are recognized as a, a PSRE, um, and we are a strategic national asset. And um, this sort of review, um, we have uh, a five year roughly, um, the last one was a little bit longer because of the pandemic, uh, uh, an international science review. 
and these are the words that came from that review. So we know where we stand, we know what our challenges are going forwards. Um, beyond metrology, we have other roles. So as a UK government chemist, I have a statutory referee function and an advisory function to government in around food and feed. Um, again, a national reference laboratory for certain areas in food and feed additives and also um, in uh, genetically modified organisms in food and feed. And uh, we also offer um, GMO authorization services for um, one of the government departments in food and feed. In addition to that, we manage MHRA laboratories um, for the chemical testing. So we look after the official medicines control um, and we work um, with the British Pharmacopeia for their monographs um, and for their reference standards that are produced as part of that. Now, our, uh, talking about combination of working, we can't do this alone, we're, we're quite small. Um, so we have agility through using our core platform technologies, analytical technologies, and apply them in different directions. And we supplement these by strategic uh, technology sector-based partnerships with universities effectively. Um, uh, and other areas. And these are what we, for our areas, they're in already identified innovation districts and you can see spread throughout the, the UK. And so this enables us to have local application and impact of the measurement capabilities that we have and to help skill people uh, in and around measurement. So this slide summarizes um, uh, some of our activities and really as part of the NMS, um, we enhance the UK RDI system in several ways. So first and foremost, um, we would say we embed the measurement um, uh, uh, research, uh, the measurement research capabilities and advice um, and see this as a, an absolutely integral link between measurement uh, standards, accreditation, policy and regulation and they're all linked and our partnerships uh, uh, reflect the combination of those um, four, five areas. We maintain and grow measurement capabilities uh, for the UK reputation with a, you know, so that the UK has a, um, a place that's um, recognised around the world as, as, a, um, as part of a global harmonised system. And that provides confidence for UK businesses, but it also provides confidence for inward investment um, from other countries. As I talked about already, we connect parts of the UK RDI eco ecosystem. So working across academia, government, industry, um, uh, uh, hospital, healthcare systems to ensure effective and coherent challenge led um, innovation. We support uh, documentary standardization um, uh, there's a lot of evidence that says countries that lead in the formation of standards, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the industry and others within that country benefit from that early adoption. So there's a lot here that we can play with. We sit typically, um, but not only, in the space of the valley of death. So we bridge that gap between research, uh, fundamental research and operational use. And I think this is really important. So we make sure that products and services can be uh, got in the right way as, as quickly as possible and as fit for purpose uh, to um, the end user. But we also operate once those product, uh, products and services are in place to make sure that they're still fit for purpose uh, going forwards. Um, as I talked about already, we supplement that with uh, complementary skills development and as I said um, already, effectively we provide that confidence in product commercialization at the end of the day. So that's the sales pitch, if you like, out of the way. But I think it highlights that, that national capability um, that, that, that we operate within. So I'm going to use three examples and a lot of words on this slide, so um, feel free to, to, to read them in your own time. But um, I wanted to highlight uh, three, three sorts of core areas. So we use our advanced nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid measurement capabilities to support the UK diagnostics industry. Um, and here we're talking beyond pandemic preparedness. Um, it may be infectious diseases, but you can also think about antimicrobial resistance, precision medicine, some of the um, uh, things of the future 
um, that we're going to have to start to think about and move towards, um, all for patient benefit. And so there's some outcomes that I've highlighted here. And that, again, this shows, I guess, from our, our perspective, um, how internationally leading we are and, and the, 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 the visibility that we have with counterparts around the world in the areas that we operate in. And this would be equivalent across um, the, the, the other uh, national measurement system laboratories. So um, I, I led delivery of the International uh, Roadmap to Metrology Readiness for Infectious Disease Pandemic Response. So we did respond uh, um, uh, internationally as metrology institutes in the last pandemic, but we need to respond faster next time. And we need to do this in a way that can be called upon by, by ministers and the like, um, you know, at a matter of a few days or weeks. So um, we established a pandemic task group um, and in that area, we're running um, measurement comparison studies now, but rather than on our month, several month time scales, we're, we're looking at um, fire drill exercises that demonstrate um, molecular diagnostics uh, uh, standardization globally. And we're now moving into the other areas going forwards. We provide a method performance assessment, and we do that through the sort of independent validation testing and advice. Um, um, examples here would include molecular point of care tests and some of the uh, non-molecular serological testing um, associated with vaccine and therapy development. We've developed test criteria um, that, that allow decisions to be made for novel diagnostics, um, uh, particularly around uh, COVID-19 variants of concern and um, uh, variants of interest, and we continue that work today in the background, I guess. Um, we value assign nucleic acid control materials for UKHSA and NHS labs that um, uh, are really important in the clinical adoption of these infectious disease tests. And it hasn't just been COVID-19. Since then, we've had um, uh, monkeypox, avian flu, swine flu, issues that are still around today if you read the newspapers. So we're providing those core materials that allow people to measure accurately. And we're taking that complementary technology approach with UKHSA um, to develop a nucleic acid uh, synthesis capability. Um, and that removes this reliance at times of uh, pandemics, but uh, on international providers. And that helps uh, improve biosecurity at the same time. Second example is um, a joint program between PSREs. Um, they're listed here working with uh, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service and healthcare agencies across all four nations. Um, and we've provided access for NHS healthcare scientists to the PSRE capabilities um, to help uh, them create and expand and test new approaches that would improve the quality of patient care. And some of those outcomes to date include improving newborn screening testing program, um, best practices for minimal residual disease testing in, in particular um, uh, cases, working with the genomic uh, laboratory hubs in, in standardizing the approaches to um, thinking about novel genomic sequencing technologies and how that can therefore be rapidly adopted into the system. Um, and others have provided um, implementation of new audits that assess and improve the accuracy of patient uh, treatment uh, for delivery of um, uh, solutions for um, detecting cancers of varying sorts. In addition, now looking forward, um, we're working with colleagues um, to think about uh, what the national vision for engineering biology might be, um, not only to revolutionize medicine, um, uh, food and environment, but to think more specifically about how that can be done. So we specifically are working with the UK RI um, BBSRC uh, funded mission hubs and awards. And our first task was to embed um, metrology and standards practice into their thinking. Um, and then with others in the system, we've been helping shape um, uh, what the regulation might need to look like for these um, products uh, in the future. So we've already delivered training for both students and early career scientists across the um, pilot UK engineering biology centers. And we're now um, starting, th th that was done face to face and remotely. And we're now rolling that out to the 
wider community, and that will that that's wider community beyond um, uh, other academic centres uh, into industry through some EAP uh, type modules. So this provides some uh, concept for upskilling the next generation of workers and helps reduce that threat of skill shortages down the line. So thinking that through is uh, quite a challenge. Um, we have taken an, a, 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 the first of several, I think, uh, draft standards to, the, uh, to ISO, to the International Standards Organization, uh, to start uh, debating about uh, gene expression analysis of engineered cell systems. And, and this is us again, I think I talked about earlier, us leading the way in new and emerging standards and regulation um, associated with that. And as I said already, we're working collaboratively with the uh, um, mission hubs and awards to now start to adopt measurement um, practice, so measurement methods, as well as materials, to help develop that robust data that best addresses the complex challenges that they're facing at the moment. So whether that's in microbial food and the regulatory hurdles that uh, um, that will face, and uh, environmental biotechnology solutions, whether it's looking at plastic pollution or recovery of metals that we've already heard uh, through environmental processing or even genetic control systems for advanced medical therapies. That's where we're operating at the moment. So final slide, um, suggestions for an incoming government. And I think some of these themes um, uh, have, have already been touched on. So in a way that that's quite good to draw them together. Um, so the first I think is effectively we need this environment that encourages long-term commitment from the national laboratories. So how, how does that long-term commitment allow us to uh, ourselves foster innovation, secure the necessary human resources, but also infrastructure needed to deliver our capabilities? And that will allow us uh, to stay at the forefront of uh, uh, scientific research and innovation, and therefore meet this uh, broader RDI system needs. We do need uh, a recognition, we do need a champion, we've heard that already, um, that values the national laboratories across the, not only the system that we have ourselves, but broader across government and even into the public. Um, and the, the benefits of that are, are indicated here. Um, we need to remove the barriers, particularly to cross-government engagement. That will allow um, uh, greater access, uh, 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 accessibility and permeability. So we get that flow across between the national labs. And last but by no means least, we have examples where we can learn and capitalize on these best practice uh, uh, examples I've already mentioned within the system. So we should hold back, we shouldn't hold back. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we've got a few minutes, um, and uh, I think I might, there's this kind of analytical framework behind this, is what are the different things that our national labs do, which we may wish to investigate. Um, we've also had an account of what we have already, and perhaps I might begin with Steve Cowley's question to the panel, which is simply, um, What's coming next? If there is a national capability or a national lab that we're missing that you would like to see created, uh, what would that be? What are the opportunities and gaps? Patrick, do you, have a, do you have a preferred proposal? Well, I have a strong view about something in general, which is don't start another national lab unless you can fund it properly. <laughs> and, and I worry that there is a danger of just picking on things and saying we'll have another institute or lab or whatever and they get underfunded and then that's a real problem and that's been a sequential problem over the last decade or so that, that we've had lots of institutes set up inadequately funded inadequately structured and that causes a problem so that, that's a rather negative no that's a very fair point and um, in fact i should have put the question in a different way then and on a one in one out proposal ah. because <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is change so why don't we say come up with a new suggestion and perhaps name a couple that we could get rid of <laughs> well, I, I do think that's an important thing to do i mean if you look across it we've got lots of peers i i don't know whether they're all needed i, I, I don't think anyone knows uh, or whether they're all doing what, what we want them to do. So I think, I think that is a sensible suggestion, actually, to look at those. Um, in terms of, you know, what's next? Well, if you look at the 
big technologies that are coming down the line, you know, what are we going to do around quantum? Are we going to have something very significant there or not? What are we going to do around engineering biology, where there is a huge need for an infrastructure to be able to support companies? And you can't be have every small company trying to be mm. good at making DNA at scale. So there's a, there's a need for something substantial around there. So I think you can pick on the great technologies that we know. What are we going to do around around the compute infrastructure mm. needs or AI yeah. across across the country. There are things that you can think of that would be important areas to consider for any uh, new national laboratory. Steve, um, you posed the mm. question. What would your answer be? And it need not be a facility in the area of nuclear fusion. <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> First of all, the question was, what was the, the, the next great global facility? In the UK, not which lab should we cancel and and uh, build a new one? Um, I, you will never get me to answer that question at all. Um, but I think there are some really interesting. And Patrick mentioned in quantum um, being able to enable the next scale up of of, of quantum computing might be something in which uh, we need to task one of our national labs to do. Um, I'm not suggesting build a new national lab, but that might be. Uh, one of the, the things I think these days, um, but I think the, the basic thing I'd like to say is we need a process to start thinking about those things and taking them forward. And because it's a hugely political thing, if you want a global scale facility and you're going to have to have, you know, seven partners in this thing and et cetera. So you need uh, political support and you need, um, you know, a strong proposal. You need a site, you need all these kind of things. Um, and, and I think we need to actually have a process for that. Um, I will say that the area, I won't mention fusion, um, that really is, is fascinating these days is um, the way light sources and imaging have t taken a step forward. I mean, we, we constructed Diamond, what, uh, you know, uh, 16, 17 years ago. Um, and uh, at, at some point, you want to go the next stage. And the great thing about uh, light sources is the, is the immense amount of science that they enable. You know, you're imaging molecules, you're imaging structure, you're imaging atomic structure. It's just um, it, it, things like free electron lasers. I'm I, I'm not proposing one. I'm just saying there's that there's opportunities there, and we should have a process to find the thing that's best for the UK. And of course, there are several different things. That one is a national laboratory. The other, which you're right to refer us back to Steve is uh, whether we go for another big the headquarters the leading world in another big international project which I guess the square kilometer array is the last one that we have uh, ended up running out of the UK and I think one of the candidates would be if we wanted to take the capacity we've already got at Bowlby in Yorkshire and turn it into a the center of a global project on dark matter is, I think, one candidate that is around, but there may be others that people would like to add to this. And of course, um, the European Union did have a framework for this that you may be familiar with. What would you have? Do you have any suggestions, Karen, for the list? Well, I actually, I actually do really like Patrick's very spontaneous answer because I think that it's always fun to speculate what kind of new shiny stuff we would like, but I think the really interesting thing is why do we want it? Because that's going to inform what we do. So I think that there's, there's, there's much more interesting to think about, do we want to put someone on Mars? Do we want the energy transition? Do we want to make uh, quantum mechanics uh, discoveries? These are very, very different things. I'm quite attached to the energy transition, for example, and I think that there's potential for lots of infrastructure, but it's not going to be that big and that shiny compared to some of the things that we're talking about here. So I actually think that the really interesting question that we should be asking ourselves, and certainly the in incoming government as well, is is what is the problem that we're trying to solve and what do we need to solve it? Right. Very good. Julian? Um, so I, I think I'm going to come at it slightly differently. I, I think I totally agree. We, we need to pick our winners or what we think will be the winners and focus on that. And I was actually going to say that um, I, I think as I, I illustrated and others have, there's a lot of capability that already exists. 
probably the best way is to decide what those winners are or, or the things that we need to try and influence and scale what we already have. So a slightly different approach rather than just plumping for something completely new. I'm sure those will come along, but I think we can do a lot by scaling yeah. what we already have. Some very good points in answer to Steve's challenge. Now let's go to the people here who would like to ask some questions and I might take uh, two or three in a row. Let's start here. And if you could give your name and organization, that'd be great, please. Thank you, Jane Gage from Airto. Um, so thinking about what we would say to an incoming government on how best to harness the national capabilities that are already there, um, I'm just interested to know what the panel thinks about some of those other organizations that are not PSREs, but are still a really big part of our national capability. So I'm thinking of the role of the catapult centers. I'm thinking of organizations, for example, that were PSREs that are now uh, independent. So mm -hmm. uh, BRE, which was building research establishment. Yeah. And also some of those other labs, like the, you know, we've got the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, we've got Fraunhofer Photonics, we've got um, other organisations that have been set up with Innovate UK support. So they're all huge assets that are out there and huge capabilities. But you know, how can we join all of that up and right. still leverage them? Yeah, a reminder that we can look beyond PSREs. Now there was another a question, yes, gentleman there, yeah. Hello. Uh, oh, Sarah. sorry, I do uh, apologise. No, that's fine. Uh, Sarah Haynes is from the University of Bath. A, a similar question, really, building on the previous one. How do we tension the uh, role of science versus the role of innovation and exploitation um, through the different institutions that we have? So we have the labs, we have the catapults, we have the Fraunhofer. And how do we get the balance across the piece between, I guess, pure science and the application of that science through engineering? Right, thank you. And then let's take one more question. I thought there was someone. Oh, yes. <coughs> thank you. John Lowe, various organizations, iMakey in particular. How do we fix? the problem of uh, STEM education to support the feedstock for the scientists and engineers uh -huh. that we need in this country. Um, and perhaps we could reflect on uh, the immigration barriers that seem to be forming into place. Yeah, let's, we'll try to stick with the national lab debate just now. There is a Hustings next week, which FST are helping to host. Well, you may like to come up and put that question again. Um, but let's start at the other end, Julian, and, and particularly uh, tell us how you, how, how your function as government chief chemist, how that interacts with bodies that aren't public sector labs, but are nevertheless part of the ecosystem that you're familiar with. And are there particular burdens on laboratories in the public sector? Because one reason for the, the reason why I did catapults the way they were is precisely they should be defined as in the private sector. And the flight out from public sector into universities is partly driven by things like pay controls and procurement rules that you have if you're in the public sector. How big a problem is that? So I think from, a, if I just put the, uh, the government chemist hat on, a lot of the people because of the system that operates are government funded in some way. But I think it, it's very, very clear that the lack of funding over time that's gone into the um, public analyst laboratories um, is causing a problem because that, that has a knock-on effect not only to the uh, capability and maintaining that capability, but also the skills required and the flow of skills that we heard from one of the other questions uh, coming forwards. So I think um, that that is a challenge. And the um, certainly we're seeing at, at ports and things like that, the ability, um, you know, there's a generational gap, if you like, I guess, in that experience. Um, and so 
um, th there is a, a shortage there that that leads to a shortage um, a again therefore on what capability is maintained within those centers and it becomes thinner and thinner and thinner or more focused and more focused now that's not necessarily a problem if it ends up in the right sort of places but i think we don't uh, you know there's a danger that if we do this in a, a drip feed way then we see a drip feed result um, and we need a plan to be able to move that forwards now i can you know i think in other areas that i operate in then um, it, it's it's very different and there, there is always a tension between um, you know what what a, a, a public uh, role is and and what might be a, a private um, a, a, a sector expectation, if you like, from organisations. But, I mean, if you have clear missions, clearly defined roles, then the two don't, don't, don't cross. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've used the PSIE term pretty, uh, pretty loosely here, because I think, I think BGS is not a PSRE formally, but we are certainly very much a, a public organization. So I, with, the, with the danger of sounding a bit like a broken record, I think that, that the really important thing is, is knowing what we want from these different research organizations and not necessarily their classification. I think that there are so many and they're so diverse and they have such different governance around them and such different funding system around them that they're really, really hard to describe in, in logical categories. But very, very many have a national capability role or a national role, a national scale role uh, or a national facility role or, or, or something like that. And I think, again, knowing what that is and, and defining that, and it would, of course, be easier to do if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper and designing a research landscape. And now we have this, this incredibly complex landscape where it's hard to, I think as Patrick was sort of saying, it's hard to actually know exactly what everyone does because it has kind of evolved into the landscape that it has today. But I think it is really, uh, it would really be ideal if there could be some sort of coordinated, what do we want from these centers? And someone actually knew individually what the various centers could deliver and how they could Play together. But isn't part of your role, and, and I may, this may be my, uh, I may have not have got this correct, but I thought part of your role, which you didn't much touch on your present, I think of you as the kind of equivalent of a copyright library, but for geological data, so that whenever people do some mining or um, some digging, you will, be, you will be able to preserve some of the material that they have to build up, uh, to act as a custodian, in other words, of a kind of national database embodied in physical samples and then a new use comes along like your fascinating example you know you know a lot about where we could do carbon capture and storage if we wanted to even though that collection of data from all those north sea oil rigs probably will no be a north sea oil drilling nobody thought they'd use it for carbon capture so isn't there a isn't there a data preservation yes role there is, but it's not the it's not the entire role. No, it's no. it's uh, but it is part of the role is custodian yes, of of a, of, of a bunch of data for yeah. sure. But there's actually no legal framework for that. So there is a there's a partial legal framework for some of it. So all the North Sea course, for example, needs to go to BGS. So about sixty percent or seventy percent of what is stored at our headquarters is is uh, NSTA, so the North Sea Transition Authority drill course, basically, that people can come and look at, and they do frequently yeah. come and look at them. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, to a lot of the other things, there's actually no legislation that tells people that they have right. to give us the data, and there's not necessarily any funding that goes to us so that we can actually deal with that data. So it's a little bit of a dynamic system, and partly, again, because it hasn't perhaps really been defined, what do we want from this particular service, and what does the nation actually need? Right. Now, Steve, um, you do you want to talk about this, this particular, especially the first question, just the range of different types of facilities and, and tell us a little bit more about the US system. My, I have to say my understanding of, of the US history was a little bit different from yours. I actually thought Vannevar Bush expected most of this new research effort he called for at the end of the Second World War to be university based. 
His report assumes a lot of it will be university-based, but the departmental, the big departments had already got a lot of their labs fought back. And you ended up with this incredibly rich mixture of a lot of money going to universities, but also departments running their own network of labs. And are there the same tensions as we've had on things like pay controls in the US? So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Van der Waals book, uh, Bush um, was the, um, the sort of architect of the National Science Foundation. But uh, the National Science Foundation is a small part of the funding of public sector science in, in, in the US. The budget at DOE is bigger than the Office of Science, and the budget at NASA is bigger. Um, these are, um, and obviously the budget at the National Institute of Health is enormous. Um, uh, so uh, it's done in different ways. And I think that there is a strength to having this variety. Somebody mentioned things like the catapult centers and, th and um, institutes. And obviously, I'm getting involved with the Faraday Institution, which I think is a, is a completely different model. It's not a national lab, um, but it's a national institution that's going to help uh, uh, with, a, with a, uh, a, a critical technology that needs to be taken forward. So it's this portfolio that you you need and I think if you look you compare us with other other countries and this was a comparison when we went over to France was the, the French have some great national labs and they bid for a huge number of the European large facilities and, and got them in France but they're missing the missing element I think in the French portfolio is really that they don't have very strong research university base yeah. um, and that really is is you know having both Right, makes you very, very strong, and only having one is is it, you, you're missing. Um. Now, uh, Patrick, I'm going to give you the final word before we break for drinks and then dinner because we've we've already slightly overshot. But yes, I mean you and uh, Mark Wolpert and Paul Nurse have all in different ways tried to create a kind of taxonomy just to understand a little bit better this incredibly complex landscape and the different type of things that they do. Do you think, and you rightly warned us a moment ago about just creating more, um, do you have any observations on just how complex this is and whether there are ways in which it could be simplified or whether there are models that you think are particularly effective as you look at this extraordinary network of which we've learned more this evening? Well, it is complex and it's always going to be complicated. I mean, I don't, I don't think we should try and assume that we can reduce this to some simplicity. And I, I really agree with the point that Steve made repeatedly, that this ability to have both universities and national labs is crucially important. I would add a third component to that, which is it became, if you look at where things worked well in COVID from a science perspective, it was where you had government uh, academia and industry working together and so the industrial science base and it goes back to the first part of the question is poorly understood generally we don't really know what's across the in, uh, the industrial science base and we need to understand that much better because it's an important part of the resilience picture now the reason I say that in relation to this question is if you go right back to Haldane and what he was talking about he talked about specific and general research yeah. Yeah. and his specific research was research that departments needed in order to do what the department looked after and general research was the research that went on in academia and other places which was curiosity driven things that government actually doesn't really know about sh and shouldn't be fiddling with too much and the specific research i think is where you do need to have a view of what you've got where the industrial strengths are, where the academic strengths are, and where the national lab strengths are. And there ought to be an understanding of that within a department, because that's really what's going to be necessary for you to fulfill your, your mission. I think, that, I think we could be better at that. Yeah, and that's, that is very astute. And if I may just follow on, well, that's one supplementary to that. Did you find, in your experience as chief scientist, that sometimes one of the reasons why departments didn't always appreciate what they'd got is it was a crisis that showed to them why we had them. So you just referred to COVID. Do you think, were, were you sometimes trying to remind permanent secretaries and departmental ministers that even if there was a lab that 
they were not seeing anything off from one month to the next. Come a crisis, we needed it. And do you think that that, how important a role was that and how widely was it understood? Well, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, science comes to the fore in government during a crisis and it needs to be there and thought of outside a crisis as well. But during, uh, during my time as government chief scientific advisor, uh, we had Novichok, which required a whole different range of skills and labs, um, uh, including, as I mentioned, unexpected ones like Ferra suddenly becoming mm. important for reasons you'd never have dreamt that they would have become important. Um, we had, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, drones over Gatwick. Uh, it turned out that there was rather little, few places to turn to to get information about that, because whilst military understood about how to shoot some drones down, it's quite difficult to shoot drones down over, over a civilian <laughs> airport. <laughs> and it's quite difficult to do jamming signals in civilian airports. So actually finding the skill set for that exposed an area that we didn't know about. What did you turn to in the end? Did well, we d I did turn a lot to industry for that, actually, because that, they, they, had a, right. they, they had thought about that in a different way. Um, and we had, uh, you remember the uh, Toddbrook Reservoir and the collapsing mm -hmm. dam, which of course needed a different skill set, and, and engineers became incredibly important there, and, as well as hydrologists, and, the, and of course there was COVID. So I think the emergencies do expose this thing, and it's quite important. And I, I think actually the permanent secretaries are much more attuned to the importance of thinking about science on a day-to-day -day basis than they, than they were. And hopefully that can get embedded because you shouldn't wait for a crisis to work out what it is you need. All right. Thank you very much. I can, I can sense a future FST event on. on a, there's a series of three or four fascinating crises already that we could learn more about. Thank you very much indeed to our participants. Thank you for being here and online. Thank you to our panelists, our wonderful speakers. We're grateful to them. Thank you to our sponsors for this event, ARC, AIRTO, National Physical Laboratory, and the National Measurement Laboratory. We'll now have a drink next door and then resume downstairs for dinner in a few minutes. Thank you all very much indeed.